I mean, I'm pissed like shit. That and more from Cardinal starter Sonny Gray coming up on B-Shave Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shave Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It's now the early morning hours of Friday, June 7th, 2024, coming on the heels of a Cardinals loss to the Rockies. That just should not have happened, folks. I mean, this was a slog of a game, if there ever was one, as the Cardinals dropped the series opener to Colorado, 3-2 to two at Bush Stadium. You're at home against one of the worst teams in baseball. You've got your top starter, Sonny Gray, on the mound, and you can't find a way to come away with the win, even when the bullpen pitches well. I mean, this was an ugly one for the Cardinals. Any way you're going to slice it, there's just no solace to be taken from a loss like this one. When coming into the series, the expectation had to be taking three out of four from this Rockies team at a minimum, and you're looking at a home stand between the Rockies for four and the Pirates for three. That five out of seven has got to be the standard. If this Cardinals team is going to find a way to make some moves and and etch itself up toward the top of the standings and be a legitimate player for the division, this is the type of homestand that you have to take advantage of. When the schedule comes to you, you take advantage of the schedule, and it's lightening up. You get a chance to play the 21-40 and 40 Rockies at home for four games, and you start off the series this way. It is not what the Cardinals were hoping for from this one, and so we'll get into all of it tonight on B-Shaped Daily, primarily focusing on where the outing went off the rails for Sonny Gray in that fifth inning where he only allowed one base hit, but he walked three, a couple of wild pitches, and a couple more runs to score that knocks him from the game before he could complete the fifth inning, the first time that that has happened to him as a Cardinal. And remember, when he began the season in mid-April, early to mid-April, coming off the injured list, he had a very severe pitch count limitation that the Cardinals were putting on him for those first couple of outings. And even in those games, he managed to go five, six innings. Wasn't able to do it tonight. And so we'll talk about his frustration at that fact. We're going to listen to the full Sonny Gray audio from the Cardinal Clubhouse, where I was stationed with a microphone in hand just a couple of feet from the man and asked him a couple of questions. And I think both my questions got the same answer. I don't know. You'll hear what I'm talking about as Sonny Gray had that for a number of us down there in the clubhouse because he was at a loss to explain what was going on with him tonight, especially in that fifth inning, which really unraveled on him. We'll talk about, too, how maybe Sonny was not the only person involved in in things kind of getting off the rails a little bit. We'll, We'll blame the home plate umpire a little bit for what happened in the third inning. But in the fifth inning, I think we do have to have some conversation about Yvonne Herrera and the struggles that he has had behind the plate in terms of managing the running game. It is at a, at a league low level at this point for Yvonne Herrera. Really like the young player, a lot of talent and upside, but the, the, the problem right now with managing the running game is coming to a head for the Cardinals, and you've got a team like the Rockies who's one of the worst in baseball, but they can read a scouting report too, and I think teams are going to start to try and take as much advantage of Herrera as possible because he just can't throw anybody out. Right now, he is 3-for-39 on the season in throwing out would-be base stealers. And it's, uh, I mean, it's been rough for him. And and it it came to a head. It really did in that fifth inning where Gray was struggling with command. And I I think the the Rockies sensed an opportunity to maybe add insult to injury. And they did. And they ran on Yvonne Herrera. I think it may have gotten to Sonny Gray a little bit when you think about the couple of wild pitches that happened. One, I think, was Holy Gray's fault, but the other one... Herrera probably should have been able to to keep in front of him. And it was just an altogether no good inning for the Cardinals and Sonny Gray. So we'll talk about all that. We'll talk about how the Rockies won this game without a hit with runners in scoring position. The Cardinals had one of those, but only one, as once again, clutch hitting was not their forte in this game. So many opportunities squandered tonight for the Cardinals. Some of them just bad luck. Some of them good defensive play. Some of them... I mean, you just kind of shake your head and wonder how the Cardinals were not able to capitalize more against Cal Quantrill, the Colorado starter, and that bullpen as the Cardinals had eight hits. They reached base via walk six times, and they come away with two runs in this game. Rockies win it 3-2. to two. Appreciate you guys for being with me tonight on B-Shave Daily. If you enjoy Cardinals content, podcasts, videos, 
Click subscribe to the channel if you'd be so kind. Brendan Schaefer, St. Louis Cardinals writer. That is literally what we do all season long, covering the Cardinals. I also cover the Cardinals for KMOV. I was there tonight uh, writing my game story for firstalert4.com. So go and check that out if you would like to support my work. And another way that you can do so is by joining the B-Shafe Daily Gang membership. No, I'm not asking you to join a gang. I'm asking you to join the channel membership if you'd like to get involved in that. The link is in the description to this video. 16 channel members and counting. So thank you guys for supporting the content and the grind of building up this channel for Cardinals fans all year long. Thanks for checking out the content. But let's get into some Cardinals baseball talk here without any further ado. We'll just go ahead and start right off the bat with Sonny Gray's audio because I want y'all to hear it so that you know the context of the, the 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 frame of mind that he was in after the game. Obviously, I figured Sonny Gray would be irritated with the way that things went, and we know that he's a guy who kind of wears his thoughts right on, on his sleeve, and he'll tell you what he's thinking and what's going on in just about every circumstance. So when he says the phrase, I don't know, as often as you're about to hear him say in this audio from the clubhouse, it, it kind of tells you something about maybe what he's going through right now on the mound because he would tell you if he did know, right? Like, that's the real sense I get from Sonny Gray covering him since, you know, just since February down in Jupiter. But I think Cardinals fans have seen enough and heard enough from this guy to know that he's a pretty straight shooter and almost so introspective to a fault where he will he will talk and talk about the different processes of his mind as he kind of works through verbally maybe what his thoughts are, and, and maybe even that process helps him to articulate and, and realize sort of what he's he's thinking at any given time. But in this instance, there was just not a lot of detail or articulation to Sonny Gray's postgame presser after he threw only four and two-thirds innings, allowed three runs, but the walks, man, that's something that is uncharacteristic for him but, but really hasn't been over recent weeks as he has struggled to sync things up. We're going to play it right here. It's about four minutes long, but it is interesting to listen to. I will say that much. And it starts off with a bang, as you heard the tease off the top of the show, as he said, you know, I pitched like you know what. Now I'm going to play his words right here as God intended. I did bleep it off the top because I wanted to tease it, but I also didn't want to get YouTube mad and have a cuss word in the first two seconds of the show. But it'll be uncensored here so you can hear how that sounded and everything else from Cardinal starter Sonny Gray after the Cardinals' loss on Thursday night. When I look back, your command was there at some spots and not in others. What do you want to make of tonight? Um, I mean, nothing. I mean, I pitched like shit. It's a trend, trending in the in the wrong direction. So I got to come in and um, come up with a plan moving forward and um, get back on track. Sonny, you mentioned last time about not being synced up. Is that still an issue, or was it something different? Tonight? If I if I knew, I'd tell you. Yeah. How does how does that fifth kind of unfold for you? There's traffic on the bases behind you. The command maybe isn't exactly where you want, or is that a situation where it needs to slow down? Like, how, how do you look at how that inning just kind of unfolds? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, not good. But I don't, I don't know. Sonny, how does that inning change on the 2 2 pitch to Cave? Talking about the third inning or the. Which, which one are you talking about? When you when he. Yeah, the third the fifth. It's in third, yeah. I mean, I struck him out, but at the same time, uh, he battled after that and mm -hmm. I made a lot of good pitches and ended up walking him. Um, yeah, I mean, I was. That that wasn't. I was okay with that. I mean, just the the length of the how it goes from a quick it could be a quick at bat to a longer at bat. That yeah, that was long. I mean, but I I felt good going out for the fourth. I felt good going out for the fifth. It just I don't know. So you're a guy who's thorough with your your preparation. Do you go back and and watch more film or try to reevaluate your plan? Anything like that? I feel like I got to um, off the top of my head right now. I just feel like I got to. I got to go back and start from the beginning. Um, go get back to the basics. Uh, force contact early, strike one. Um, force guys to put the ball in play early. Get back through the middle of the plate early in the count. Um, not trying to be too fine early. Uh, just get back to the middle. Um, 
everything everything seems to be better for me and more in my favor when I am getting ahead of guys early and the best way that I've done that in the past is really just shoot right down the middle of the plate. I do feel like over the last probably couple weeks we've been going to more edges early um, which tends to for me when I do that and this is not just a new thing but it's happened to me in the past and um, I remember I remember going through this a little bit last year where I went through a four, five, six start stretch where I just continued to walk people. And the biggest jump from that um, was a mindset swap to be aggressive early through the middle of the plate. And um, I think that's I think that's where I got to get back to is is get back to the middle of the plate and, and not trying to be too fine early in the counts. Um, so I think that could that could be that could be a, a good starting point for me. You mentioned Some, feeling good coming out for the fifth. Was there a moment where you sensed that change as it was happening, or just kind of hard to identify? No, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I felt good throughout. Just lost the lost the zone a little bit. So you had that stretch there. You had an, an inning. I think it was four batters total with strikeouts back to back to back to back. There is there something to take from that, or was there something that switched? Or, did you feel at all like you were getting away with any pitches there? Or? No, I mean, like, that's not the job of a starting pitcher. The job of a starting pitcher is not to go through spurts of great. And then the, the job is to is to stay out there for as long as you can and put your team into a position to win. So, yeah, like, oh, yeah, okay, I struck four hitters out in a row. Who cares? Um, it's not, it's not the, the point of... Of a, of a starter, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. How did you see the wild pitches playing out there, and did it contribute at all to kind of the inning speeding up on you? Do you feel? I don't know. So there you have it from Cardinal starter Sonny Gray. There's a lot that he didn't know, didn't want to get into necessarily. At the end there, I was kind of just curious as to whether we'd get anything about you know the wild pitches. If you're the pitcher, and you maybe feel like. One or two of those aren't your fault, which I do think the first one totally was. The second one, like you spike a curveball, you got to be able to have trust in your catcher to keep it in front of him with men on base. But he's not going to throw Ivan Herrera under the bus for the way that he pitched, right? But it was just kind of getting short answers, and so various questions there didn't get a lot of insight necessarily. But there was actually an area where you did get some insight if you heard it when he talked about maybe what he needs to do moving forward and mentioning that they've been in the last couple of weeks, maybe been looking to the edges of the strike zone a little too much and a little too early. And as he's dealing with struggling with command and walking guys, I think that's maybe the closest he got to explaining what's going on. Does he feel that they need to get back to, him having the aggression and the aggressiveness and the the lack of you know concern or fear to work the middle of the plate and not trying to be too fine early in counts. Go ahead and get the strikes so that you can get ahead in counts, basically. And if guys are going to be swinging on the first couple pitches as you're working to get ahead and get strike two on a guy, if they're if they're swinging, you know, and they beat you, then they beat you. But Sonny Gray, I think, would rather take his stuff because he has so many pitches and even if he is playing to the middle of the zone there's a chance that he's you know better than a chance there's a good likelihood that he's going to be able to get guys out if they're hacking early in counts but for him it's so important to get ahead because once he is ahead he's got a a vast arsenal of pitches that he can put you away with but if you don't get to two strikes and you don't do it before you get to two or three balls it's a lot more difficult You're, you're pitching from behind when he pitches from ahead Sonny Gray is lethal. And I think when he first came off the IL, he had that mentality of, look, I, I know I don't have a lot of pitches to work with, so if I'm going to try to get as deep into these this, these games as I can, that's going to come with me having to work the middle of the plate and not having fear of it. And so is there a little bit of an angle there of, well, we've been working the edges a little more and and some dissatisfaction with that? That may be a conversation that he has with Ivan Herrera and Pedro Pajes about, way the way they want to proceed and and he says look if I am walking four guys that's not going to cut it so to ensure that I am not getting into these situations again I have to make it part of my mentality 
that it's got to be forefront of mind. I'm going after these guys, and if it's middle of the zone, that's okay. They're, you know, it's not a miss if you're doing it on purpose, I guess. And maybe trying to be a little bit too fine on the edges is something that's gotten him into almost a backwards mentality, and it's maybe not conducive to the way that he likes to pitch. So I thought that actually was for all the the I don't knows that Sonny Gray delivered in that post game. That was maybe the most interesting where you did get a little bit of insight as to the way he's looking at it. Let me know, Cardinals fans, what you think of that. Um, Again, this is a guy that talks pitching, loves talking pitching, and is always willing to share kind of what's going on in his mind. So when he he says multiple times, I don't know, you know, is there some element of I just don't want to talk about that because it may paint somebody else in a bad light and we're going to get on the same page behind the scenes? Yeah, maybe, but it also, I think, is an element of as he started that interview, he didn't know. He didn't really have the explanation And then there was one question that triggered it, and he sort of, I think, thought through it out loud, and you got a chance to hear that up close and personal. So maybe that's something to look for from Sonny Gray moving forward, Um, but but walks is not something that he takes much pleasure in. I mean, he doesn't like it. He does not like putting guys on for free, and even asking about walks can rankle the guy at times because he doesn't like doing it, and so it's it's not going to be a pleasure point to talk about, but... Let me know your thoughts on Sonny Gray's outing. We will mention that the third inning, I mean, Scott Berry, home plate umpire, did cost the Cardinals in a way that first run because Sonny Gray had Jake Cave struck out at least once in that AB. It was a 2-2 sweeper in particular that caught the bottom of the zone well on the corner, but not even. I mean, it was plenty of plate that this pitch got and didn't get the call. And you heard Sonny say there in the audio that we played, I struck him out. You know, he's making no bones about it. Ollie Marmel was a little more diplomatic. He said he, he brought it up in his post game, but said, I haven't actually gotten a chance to look at the the pitch again to see essentially how bad they got screwed. But, you know, I, I think that was being diplomatic. I think he knew, too, that it was it was a missed call. And, you know, it's one of those things that you don't want to let a missed call because those happen. It sucks when it happens, but you don't want to let that impact you the rest of the way. But the weird part about it is, although that run did end up scoring because he gave a base hit after that, which was first and third at that point, and then Charlie Blackman grounded out, looked like a double play, originally was called as such, but replay review showed that the runner at first was safe, which meant the run from third base at that point scored. But that didn't rattle Sonny Gray necessarily. Like the next four batters he faced after that moment were struck out got a K to end that third inning and then struck out the side in the fourth on like, I don't know, 12 pitches. He was just dominant at that point. But then the setback comes in the fifth inning and that's where everything sort of fell apart for him. One hit allowed in the inning, but three walks, two wild pitches, two stolen bases, a partridge and a pear tree. It was rough. I mean, it was a slog. And part of the reason this game was almost three hours which, thank you, Bud Black, by the way. Really appreciate you uh, changing pitchers there with two outs in the ninth, man. Nobody on, two outs in the ninth inning of a three-hour game, and Bud Black says, yep, got to go to this other dude. This is the guy. This is the guy that's going to get us through for the 21-40, and 40, now 22-40, and 40, I guess, Colorado Rockies. I'm just complaining. That's all. It's no big deal. You know, that's the one thing I, I do say about the, the rule changes. And, no, I guess they are 21-40 and 40, now that I'm looking at the uh, – so yeah, a 20 and 40 team at the time. And they uh they're they're managing like it's game 7, baby. No, I'm kidding. This is professional baseball. If you're Bud Black, you have to do what you think is going to give your team the best chance. But I almost thought it would have would have spiraled on him, would have kind of backfired because they took out Jalen Beeks, the left-hander, and brought in a righty that I've never heard of, Kinley. And he's got an ERA over eight, Tyler Kinley, 33 years old. Why haven't I heard of this guy? Yeah, I don't know. He's been around. He's been with Colorado since 2020. He was with Miami in 2019. Hell, he's been pitching since 2018. I don't know why this guy has slipped under my radar. He's with Minnesota in 2018. All right, well, that's on me. But he's got an eight ERA even after tonight, getting the out that he did to uh, to close it out. But I thought it was interesting because a right-hander against Goldschmidt, okay, makes sense. You don't want to let Goldie face a lefty, perhaps, because his splits have been conducive to some good things offensively in those spots. But Gorman is a left-handed batter on deck, and I thought, man, that could end up burning you, although Gorman has shown his ability to hit 
just about anybody recently and take him yard. But, you know, even lefty on lefty matchups have not evaded Gorman's ability to hit home runs. But I thought, you, you know, if goalie gets on, now Gorman could easily launch the game winner and, you know, turn things around in a hurry at, in terms of the mood at Push Stadium. But my goodness, the at bat of Kinley versus Gorman made Gorman look foolish. I don't know how that was or what happened, but Bud Black must have, some scouting report must have known or had a, had a good idea that even if it came to be that Kinley had to face the lefty, that he was going to have something for him, which is kind of crazy. The guy's got an ADRA. But anyway, that ended up going the way that it went, and that was kind of the story of the night for the Cardinals offensively. We broke it down as much as I, I think I'm going to regarding Sonny Gray. It just, you know, four and two-thirds innings. He only gave up two hits, but four walks is very uncharacteristic until it's kind of not because we've seen him from time to time have those struggles recently, and clearly he's not happy about it. 0.9 ERA was his ERA before his start on May 9th, and less than a month later he's up to a 3.21 ERA. I It's a trend, trending in the wrong direction, so uh, we'll see what kind of plan he and the Cardinals can come up with um, but but like I said, clearly right now he does not really have the answers for 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 what's going on, and uh, the stuff is still good. It's just command's got to get dialed in. He didn't get hit hard. I mean, the Rockies hardly hit the ball all day against Sonny or or against the the bullpen either, and it's just one of those. I mean, they they won this game with four base hits. Carlos had eight hits, but only came up with the two runs. So just a really it was a tough, frustrating game to watch if you're a Cardinals fan. There's no doubt about it. But I want to talk a little bit more about the Herrera thing. Three for 39 at this point, throwing out base runners. That's toward the bottom of baseball and stolen bases allowed, uh, despite fewer starts than almost everybody else toward the bottom of that list. And like I said, the first wild pitch, thought he was crossed up pretty rough on on Sonny. But then the second one, I think you got to block it if you're Herrera. And the Cardinals, look, they have said he's made strides behind the plate. But this one was rough, and I, I think Ollie Marmol wanted to isolate it more to it's the throwing arm for him that is, you know, the, the weakness, and it's something that he's been working on. We'll go ahead and real quick play the audio from Ollie just talking about Avon Herrera as Katie Wu asked the question. Like, what would you like to see from him with the run game? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, you're asking about his arm specifically and this is something that he's continuing to work on it's not a a huge strength of his at the moment he does other things well this is something he's worked on throughout the minor leagues and he's going to continue to it's something that he's paying very close attention to but it's also something that's not going to happen overnight yeah so as i mentioned the cardinals have been you know willing to talk about the strides that avon herrera made defensively and, and game management and all those sorts of things but I still think there's maybe a bit of a deficit, and especially when it comes to managing the running game, that's something that's that's kind of an exploitable weakness of the Cardinals team right now and a reason that you'd love to get Wilson Contreras back as soon as you can. Not that you know Herrera's been a net negative offensively. He's done a nice job. I, I think defensively, though, still a major work in progress, and I just don't know long-term how viable that situation becomes if he's going to be... You know, as a backup, I think you can you can live with that. But right now, the Cardinals are asking him to carry a, a pretty hefty load, and teams around the league are are realizing, uh, you know, it's taken them this long. But the fact that he's allowed now thirty six stolen bases and in only thirty five starts, thirty six games that he's that he's been behind the plate at all, I think more and more teams are going to try to run wild on him and and basically force force the issue a guy's got a an 077 batting average you're going to feel pretty good about facing that hitter if you're a pitcher well that's the similar situation here because three for 39 and throwing out would-be base stealers is 077 as far as his caught stealing rates so I think I think teams are going to continue to run on him um, with frequency and kind of without reservation at this point until he proves that he can do something about it and that's what I would do. Anytime you get on first base, I'm running on Herrera within the first pitch or two of that next at bat, unless I know it's just a super slow guy on first because he is not. You're you. It's now probably something that's in the in the guy's head, right? Maybe it, it, the numbers look worse than his skill level at the at the role is in throwing out base runners, but at a certain point, it can kind of get in your head. And so, I think other teams are going to exploit it. I think the Cardinals are going to have to live with it. You know, because Pedro Pajes is not the hitter that Yvonne Herrera is, and Herrera needs to be the primary catcher until Wilson gets back. 
Um, looking up Wilson's numbers, he's been really good against uh, the, the controlling the running game, but obviously has been out for you know close to a month now or whatever it's been. And the Cardinals are saying he's going to get some imaging done. Um, either this was to, to happen today or tomorrow and find out if that can clear him for baseball activities and, and returning from his broken arm. That would be huge because if, if they fully clear him to start his ramp up, maybe he's back within three weeks or so. Like, I think it's possible we do see Wilson Contreras in the month of June uh, playing for the Cardinals. I think it could be a bit of a stretch, though, because they may want to give him a longer rehab. But it's, I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that he's there, if not you know late June, the very tippy top beginning of July. So that would be really nice, not only offensively with what he was able to do. He was the best Cardinals hitter when, at the time when he went down and, and still would be in terms of OPS on the team. But, it, I mean, the defensive aspects of it and the, the strides he made. Now, of course, you think about how he got hurt. It was by pitch framing and, and trying to steal a little bit of extra space there. And he got clocked by the bat. And that's what broke his arm. So, you know, it, it, I, what he said that night was, I'm not changing anything. When I come back, I'm going to be doing the same stuff to try and steal strikes for my pitchers. But uh, especially the, the running game was uh, a really encouraging aspect of what Contreras was doing in the early going, as well as what he was doing at the plate. So that's just what I wanted to get into a little bit. Let me know your thoughts, Cardinals fans. Like, you see what I see. Cardinals see it too, but as Ollie said, it's not something that's going to change overnight. He is working on it, but that's all he really can do is work on it and try to improve at it. But uh, to this point, I, I don't think it's up to par, and I wonder if at all that that it impacted Sonny Gray just to know that, man, I'm, I'm having to be perfect here in this inning and if I'm not, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, my catcher might not be able to to keep control of the situation if we start getting some base runners on the move. And it was. It felt like kind of a parade going on in that inning against Sonny Gray and Yvonne Herrera. And uh, look, again, like it shouldn't have cost the Cardinals this game. Sonny didn't cost the Cardinals this game. Yvonne Herrera did not cost the Cardinals this game. You lose this game because you went one for seven with runners in scoring position and you you just didn't take advantage of, of many of your offensive opportunities. Eight hits, six walks. Cal Quantrill walked four, and you you have to be able to do more against him. You just do. And they had the one inning in which they they mustered something against the bullpen. Michael Ciani had the RBI hit. Good to see. And uh, they they score as well on an error. That two runs. I mean that's that's nice, but it's not it's not enough. They had to had to had to do more. And this was supposed to be the the, the series as we talked about yesterday where the Cardinals kind of go above and beyond in terms of scoring, you know, six, seven, eight runs. They need to be doing that consistently and save their back end of the bullpen a little bit. And and not only did they not do that, well, they did, I guess, because they didn't have a lead. So you didn't even have to think about the triumvirate going tonight, but just brutal. I mean, uh, there were some bad luck elements involved, as I mentioned off the top. Matt Carpenter hit a home run that guy ran, jumped up and caught. You know, it was over the wall. It would have been a homer. Had the glove not been there, and uh, right fielder Michael Taglia comes up with it, robs him. Goldschmidt Gorman had consecutive batted balls to the warning track right in front of the wall. I think that might have been the fifth inning, but you know, just 400 feet almost for Goldie, and, and Gorman was the opposite way, and it still almost left the yard. And it was the pitch that I did my yard call up in the Cardinal press box because I thought first pitch Gorman's going to be hacking if he gets a pitch to hit. And so I guess that that would be the, the homer pitch. You get one pitch per night, and uh, I was like, did I, just, did I just hit that? But no, Gorman did not quite get enough to the opposite way. And so, you know, you some good batted balls, but, like, excuses aren't worth a dime at this point. You have to beat the Rockies with great pitching. The expectation, even after that, still has to be three or four, or you didn't do your job. So, uh, like, a split does not cut it against this team at home, even after you lose game one. I can't say, oh, well, you win two of three, split. No, you have to beat the Rockies. They're terrible. And if you if you don't, then you know you've got some real questions. And I know Cardinals fans listening are saying, "No, there's already real questions." I get it, but this was going to be the opportunity, or supposed to be, for you to kind of build a little bit of that cushion and say, "No, we're not one of those teams hovering right below 500. We're one of the contenders." And if you don't take advantage of these opportunities on your schedule, they don't come around all too often. And it it certainly is here this week. And you know, so far, not so good. The Cardinals. 0 for 1 in a series where, or a homestand rather, where they really needed to win 5 of 7. And I still think they do. Find a way. I, I'm i not here to judge how you do it or tell you how to do it. I just look at the standings and go, you know, this is really the spot that you need to do that because then later you you can't turn around and say, 
Like, if you don't take care of your business against a team like the Rockies and the Pirates, you can't turn around later and say, well, the schedule tightened up on us. We've got some really good teams coming up. That So, I mean, that you got to win those games too, but you can tread water against the winning teams if you beat up on the bad ones. That's a strategy that can work. But if you don't beat up on the bad ones, if you only go four out of seven in this homestand, which, hell, it could be worse. I mean, you've lost the first game, so anything could happen. But if you only go four or seven, that's not a success. That's not going to get you anywhere. The Cardinals need to find a spot on the schedule to build, and this is it. But, you know, so far, they, they're not doing it with, with the way they lost this game tonight. Just got to do more offensively. And look, if you can get eight hits and six guys on base via walk, that's 14. It left 11 on base, I think the Cardinals did tonight. If you're doing that, like, you you do have a problem with runners in scoring position. Like, it's not... The way that it was was you know chalked up by Ellie Marmel at, at points, and I understood his point at the time to say like, look, it's not a we don't have a risk problem with this team specifically. We just have a general offensive approach problem that needs to be fixed. And I think the Cardinals have gone a long way toward doing that. But you also are very glaringly struggling with runners in scoring position or just with runners on base. One for seven with risk, and they had guys on base all night, and they scored two runs. That you have to be able to punch in and cash in when you're putting yourselves in position to do so and the cost the Cardinals tonight. And it really is a bummer, too. The shame of it with the offense kind of falling back into those listless patterns is that the bullpen, even with Gray's struggles, did way more than enough to turn this into a win. Matthew Libertor came in, John King, and how about Chris Roycroft, folks? I mean, this was a really nice performance. The Cardinal bullpen, those three, none of the triumvirate pitched. Because you were down in the game, obviously. It's not their spot. But those three combined for four and a third innings, two hits allowed, one walk, and four strikeouts, three of which belong to Roycroft. I don't know. Like, lowers the ERA to 4.15. The last time he was up, he got hit around a little bit. But an inning and two thirds of scoreless, hitless, walkless baseball with three Ks for Roycroft, maybe he can be that answer, the right handed bullpen answer that they're looking for. Um, but. You know, just one sample size, a data point of one right now, but certainly if he continues looking like he did tonight, there would be some some intrigue to that. And by the way, the, the right-handed bullpen answer to kind of add to the 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 group of Helsley and Kittredge and, and Ryan Fernandez in that circle of trust, it's not Giovanni Gallegos, I don't think, after tonight. Uh, he was on a rehab assignment in Memphis, gave up a bomb to Drew Waters. I think he gave up like three runs. I don't know, man. Um, uh, Gio wasn't really like, I guess he had the shoulder impingement, but he didn't get put on the injured list until after he was just untenable on the roster because of how bad he was pitching. So I don't know how much you can fix an injury that was almost kind of only, only created out of necessity. It's not to say he wasn't injured, but they, if he was pitching better, I think he would have kept playing. Right. But he wasn't, and they couldn't keep him on the roster. So they had to send him out for a while. But now you you could take as much as you want on this rehab. I think you get 20 days on a rehab assignment, whatever it is. But it's not looking good so far. So I don't know if you bring him back if he if he's not looking good. But that that would be a really unceremonious end to his time with the Cardinals. So I imagine they will bring him back at some point, especially if the rehab turns around. But take as long as you need. Like I don't think you're rushing him back because he's not the answer if you if you're bringing it back off of you know the way it looked tonight. Matts was good though. Stephen Matts started for Memphis, two innings, scoreless. Couple Ks, good to see. Sam Robertson did not seem to enjoy pitching behind the rehabbers, though. That was not pretty. He recorded, I think, one out and gave up seven earned runs, something to that effect. So that wasn't ideal. But you know, we'll see. Maybe it's just a case of he's normally the starter and he had to come in in like third inning or whatever it was because of accommodating the the two rehabbing guys. But anyway, Memphis, I think, lost. The Cardinals certainly lost three to two to the Rockies tonight at Bush Stadium. Let me know your thoughts on it, on Sonny Gray, on the offense continuing to scuffle, and on Yvonne Herrera in terms of his kind of inability right now to manage the running game effectively. Put your comments in below on YouTube. Make sure you hit the subscribe button before you get out of here. Hit like on this video too, and consider a channel membership if you want to support me and the work that I'm doing. Uh, go read my article for KMOV so they, they stay happy with me too. All right, that's going to do it. I'm going to get out of here because it is way too late, and I've got morning radio on Friday morning. 590 The Fan, 590TheFan.com. Uh, me and Jimmy the Cat Hayes get to talk some baseball. He'll be in tomorrow, and I'll be in with Cam and, and Cole as well. So check that out, 7 to 10 a.m. on 590 if you're interested. But we'll post some various oddities if we do talk some Cardinals baseball on the channel later this week. So stay tuned for 
that. That's really going to do it for this edition of the show. Appreciate you guys, as always, and we'll talk to you next time on Be Safe Daily. Peace.